The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book 2 North or Be Eaten. Chapter 22 The Stranders of the East Bend. The Strander stepped from behind the tree. She was a girl not much older than Janner, covered from head to foot with black dirt that made her eyes and teeth bright. Tattered clothes hung from her skinny frame. In her hand was a dagger, and the way she held it made it clear she knew how to use it. Sin Macau, the girl demanded. Got her good just yesterday, and she ran this way. Even ye ate her, I'll carve ye up and bring ye back to camp in a sack. Nobody ate your cow loss, Odo said, stepping forward. The girl hissed and brandished the knife at the old man. I ain't your loss, she spat. And you'd best not take another step forward, or I'll put an end to one of ye before ye have time to notice I'm gone. Odo held up his hands. You throw that knife and nobody's telling you where the cow is. We don't mean ye any harm. So why didn't you ease up and tell us your name? Mine's Podo, Podo Helmer. Don't care who ye are, just want me cow. Podo and the girl engaged in a glaring contest that, to Janner's surprise, the girl won. Fine, Podo said. The two thick cows a half day's walk behind us. You'll find the remains of a campfire we were foolish enough to light, and your cow, door what's left of it, is nearby. The strander girl narrowed her eyes at Podo and considered the information. Right, she nodded. I believe you. Now drop your weapons. Don't get too big for your britches, lass, Odo rumbled. Nobody's dropping any weapons. The girl threw the knife so fast that Janner hardly saw her move. It thunked into something wooden, and he saw with shock that it was embedded in Poto's peg leg. The girl had already drawn a second knife and stood ready to hurl it at Lily. Enough! Poto said with his hands in the air. We'll give ye our weapons, all right? No need to do anything drastic. Good. We'll take your packs, too. We? Without a sound, more children appeared from behind trees and swung down from branches, each of them fierce as a horned hound and ready to kill. The Igbies backed into a huddle around the still-snoring body of Oscar and Reteep. Without warning, Oscar sat up, spouting the sounds of old Hollish letters, and declared he had unraveled another piece of a linguistic puzzle. He fumbled for his spectacles, placed them on his nose, and said when he saw the gang of dirty children, Good morning! We'll be taking you lot with us, the girl said. Barakin, take five others and find the cow. Bring back as much as you can carry. Hurry it up! Without a word, one of the boys chose five children, and they slipped into the forest as silent as shadows. The remaining stranders, Janner counted eleven, gathered the Igby's packs and weapons and rifled through them, pocketing food and matches and whatever else they fancied. To Janna's relief, they showed little interest in the first book, the whistle harp, or Tink's sketchbook. When the girl was satisfied the packs were sufficiently plundered, she tossed them back to the Igby's. Then she approached Poto with a wary eye and yanked her dagger from his peg leg. Come on, then. Camp ain't far. At a nod from Poto, the Igby's and Oscar followed. If Poto was taking orders, then these strander children were dangerous indeed, Janner thought. They varied in age and size. Some were boys and some were girls, though the girls carried themselves like no girl Janner had ever seen. He was certain that, girl or boy, the strander children were all deadly accurate with their daggers. Whenever Poto or Naya tried to communicate with the Igby children, the girl leader hissed and waved her knife. Lily bore up like the princess she was, hurrying along on her crutch without complaint. And to the Stranders' credit, they allowed Poto and Janner to take turns carrying her on their backs from time to time. Within the hour, Janner smelled smoke and spotted signs of a camp not far away. Several figures around the fire stood and peered into the trees at their approach. They were filthy and bedraggled and seemed content to be so. Janner could see the mighty river Blap not far away, wide and quiet. Have you got it? asked one of the men. Yes and no, answered the girl. May we come near? No one said a word. Janner glanced at his family and saw fear on all their faces, except Poto, whose jaw was set and whose eyes glinted like hot metal. The stranded children stood in silence around the Igbies, looking back and forth between the man at the fire and the girl. 
And who have you got with you? Asked the man. Don't know. Found him not far from here. And you found the meat, did ye? I already said I did. The man at the fire tilted his head in anger or admiration. Janner couldn't tell. All right, then. Come near. The stranded children slipped in among the adults. If they had parents, it didn't show. None of the children hugged or greeted anyone. They stood near the fire with half-hidden smiles and held out their hands to the flame. Where's the food, Morale? The man asked the girl. On its way. Sent Bannikin with the company to fetch it. Found this lot sleeping not far from here. Had weapons they did. Another of the children dumped the swords, knives, bows, and arrows to the ground. We don't aim to stay long, Bodo said. You can keep the weapons and whatever supplies you like. The man approached. A long beard hung from his face and matted locks that looked like a cluster of dead brown snakes. He wore his hair tied back, revealing a high, dirty forehead with a jagged scar across it. Listen, Bodo said. We don't want to trouble you. We're headed to Dugtown and we'd like to be on our way. The dirty man straightened to his full height, a hand taller than Poto, and looked down into the old pirate's face. You'll be on your way when I say you can be on your way. Move over to the fire and make yourselves comfortable. There's much to be done. Janner turned away and he turned away and barked at his clan. Tie him up! The other stranders rushed forward. They pushed and tugged, laughed and spat at the Igbies as they moved them to the fire and tied their hands behind their backs. The Igbies sat on a bench near the fire while the stranders went about their business, either punching one another in the shoulder in some kind of game, sharpening daggers, or making awful faces at the children to see if they could make them cry. Janner admired Tink's restraint. He knew his little brother could make ugly faces with the best of them, but he chose to stare at the fire instead. Two of the men erected a spit above the fire, flashing black-toothed grins at the children. Janner noticed hundreds of bones in the dirt around the fire pit, some of them tiny fish bones, some of them as long as his arm. It explained why the animals in the forest had been so scarce. He saw the skulls of bumpy dig toads, toothy cows, and daggerfish half buried in the ashes and dirt. There were no human skulls, but with the hungry way the stranders looked at them, he wouldn't have been surprised. They didn't tie our ankles, Tink said quietly, but I suppose it's no good trying to run away, is it? No, son, said Naya. They know these woods. We wouldn't stand a chance. We could fight, Lily said, or you could fight. I wouldn't be much help, but if you could get your hands free, the weapons are right over there. I appreciate the notion of fighting as much as anyone, said Poto, but as long as they don't mean to cook us on that spit. I think we'll best to take things slow for now. They sat that way for hours, uncomfortable, hungry, and thirsty. The presence of the Blap a short distance away acted as a constant reminder that they hadn't had anything to drink since breakfast. When at last the sun set, the Strander children returned with the toothy cow. They'd cut the meat from its bones and carried it in sacks, which they dumped out on a canvas beside the fire. Like flies to old food, the stranders gathered around the flames. The man with the beard appeared with a barrel, and the stranders cheered. The two men who had erected the spit skewered hunks of toothy cow meat and hung them over the fire, where they steamed and hissed, producing a surprisingly delicious smell. Might as well let ye have a bite and a swallow, said a voice just behind the Igbies. It might be your last. The leader of the Stranders freed each of their hands, then leaned over Poto. Ye seem the type that'll know this be true. If you try and run, we'll kill you and toss your bodies into the blop. Understood? Poto looked like he wanted to punch the man in the nose, but he nodded. Good, the Stranders said. The girl Marale appeared with a basket of odd-sized bowls and cups, filled them with liquid from the barrel, and passed them around. Janner sniffed the drink in his bowl. It smelled sweet and warm, but he wasn't sure he wanted to try it. He heard a slurping sound to his right and turned to see that Tink had already finished off his cup. What does it taste like? Janner asked. Who? It tastes wet. Who cares? I was thirsty. Tink held out his cup for more. 
Marley looked at the shaggy bearded man who nodded and she refilled Tink's cup. The Stranders were laughing and clapping and telling stories just like the Dugtowners that came to Glipwood on Dragon Day. And, as on Dragon Day, Janner found it hard not to like them for it. They seemed not to have a care in the world. When the meat was declared done, two men removed the skewer from the fire and passed it around. The Stranders tore the brown, juicy meat from the stick and devoured it like dogs, smacking and sucking their teeth in a way that disgusted Janner and made him hungry. He couldn't believe toothy cow meat could smell so good. Tink held his hands over his stomach and sat with his mouth half open, watching as the skewer made its way around the circle. Tink moaned when the skewer finally reached him, tore off a hunk of meat and gobbled it up. The leader turned to his clan and raised his voice. Stranders of the East Bend, they answered. Quick hands, long beards, he cried, and sharp daggers. No law, shouted the leader. No law! They raised their cups and roared with laughter. Now then, clan, the man said, raising a hand. It's time we got to know our new friends. My name is Claxton Weaver. I'm a thief, a wanderer, and a swinger of steel. I don't like fangs. I don't like strangers, and I don't like rules. These are my people, and this is my camp. And we'd just as soon toss ye into the river as let ye have another scrap of our meat. So you'd better think of something that ye have or something you can do for me that'll help me understand why I should let ye keep breathing. The Stranders' good cheer vanished, and they scowled at the family. Oscar stopped mid-chew and looked up at the man. Lily, Naya, and Janner froze as well. The only sound was Tink's lips smacking as he ate his meat, aware of nothing but his hungry belly. Bodo considered the man for a moment and said, Die well, we've got food. We've got weapons, as you can see. I am willing to let you have the lot of it if you let us go safe and hail, Claxton Weaver. Then the old pirate's voice deepened and his nostrils flared like a mad horse's. But if you decide that's not enough, then you need to know that my name's Bodo Helmer and I rove the strand before you were born with the likes of Grelfist and the Pounders. Don't look so surprised, laddie. I crept the west Redoubt out with Yule Baron by the light of the hangar moon. I've sailed the mighty Blap a hundred times from here to the edge of the map, and I can fight with Han's teeth and even my eyebrows if it comes to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Blackster Weaver stood aghast, his face so wretched and alarming that even Tink stopped chewing his meat. Naya pulled Lily close. Janner's body tensed, and he wished his sword were at hand, because he feared he would soon need it. The stranders around the fire sat still as stone. Poto stood and looked into Claxton's eyes. But listen here, Weaver. I can see a ruleless bend in the river. I'm old and one-legged, but I'm no fool. If it's strangers you don't like, then save it for the next ones that scra scrape into your bend. I'm as much a strander as you are. I'm no fang, and I've offered you everything we have. If that's not enough, then me boys and I will fight like dragons. Photo took a step nearer the old man. And you're the first one I aim to lay me teeth and me bushy eyebrows on. Janner's skin prickled with pride, and he curled his fingers into fists. He knew there were nothing like Poto's weathered hands, but they would have to do. Claxton's eyes flitted to Janner and Tink, then Oscar, considering Poto's threat. Ye crept the west reed out, he asked. Really? By the light of the hangar moon! Claxton's eyes narrowed and burned with a cold light. Such a fierce look passed between the two men that Janner cringed, as if all the darkness in each man's soul poured out and fought a great battle in the space between them. It wasn't clear who won, but Claxton appeared satisfied that Poto was at least a worthy enemy, if not a comrade. The tension faded from the bearded man's face, and he smiled. Then I found a reason to allow ye to live, Poto Helmer. You're gonna tell us a tale on account of the strand in the days of your youth. Me clan and I will sleep tonight with the thrill of old stories in our bones. Claxton's smile vanished, and he lowered his voice. But if what ye have a get to give ain't good enough, old man, then it'll be the blap or my blade for you and your company. 
We Stranders can fight like dragons too, remember? Claxton turned to the clan. Can't we? The Stranders bared their teeth and hissed. In one deadly motion, the men, women, and children around the fire drew their knives, ready to leap over the fire at Claxton's order. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 23 Growl Fist the Strander King. Poto stood with the Stranders, shifting his weight from his good leg to his stump and back again. Claxton sat on a log in the center of his clan, his arms folded across his chest. The Igbies and Oscar gathered behind Poto. The fire had burned down to a steady red glow that turned the air the color of a bad dream. Poto Helmer, Claxton said. Proceed. Janner looked at his grandfather in a new light. It seemed the old man had no end of secrets. But as much as Poto hated his past, and as much as Janner hated to imagine his dear grandfather running with such a wretched band, there was a chance it might save all their lives. He knew his grandfather had a story in mind, but he had serious doubts that Claxton and his hissing, knife-wielding people would turn them loose to, no matter how rousing the tale. Poto closed his eyes for a moment and took a deep breath before he began. Stranders! I stand before you with but one leg, me hair white with age, and me belly full of your good meat. This fire here burning low sends me thinking about Graufist the Strander King on the night I first met him. The Stranders murmured and nodded their heads. Aye, I met him all right. Fierce he was and a full head taller than Claxton here. It was said his eyes were so mean he could look a fish just, cook a fish just staring at it. And I'm here to tell you it's true. Saw him do it any number of times. Many years ago, I was fishing in a bend of the blop not far from here, bobbing in a boat with a bucket full of red gill, when I saw a dark parade wend its way down from the North Hills. Filthy they were, and a cloud of dirt hovered over them like a storm set to burst. Indeed, lightning crackled from the dirt cloud, and a miry thunder rolled. Stranders, I thought, and I shivered in me boat. The Stranders cackled with pride. I'd never seen them up close. Not real Stranders, mind ya. Some of those closer to Dugtown call themselves Stranders. But you of the East Bend know the men from girls, don't ye? The clan snarled and laughed and pounded fists on knees, including the girls, Janner noticed, Marley loudest of all. Well, I'd been drifting for a few days. I knew folks as far down the river could only be dangerous. And to tell it straight, that's why I floated as far as I did. Danger was nothing for Poldo Helmer, scrabbly and young as I was. Then a voice comes tearing at me from the tallest man I ever saw. He was the eye of the dirt storm, and the stranders around him swirled like the wind. Come near, he commanded a voice as deep as the river, and my boat fairly paddled itself across the current to where Graufist the Strander King stood. The nearer I came, the more fearsome was his appearance. Teeth like clamshells, a jaw like a tree root, a shaggy head as brown and muddy as a bumpy dig tone's hide feet. Again, the Stranders muttered their approval. Poto continued. I stood before Growl Fist on both me feet. Now, this was before I lost my legs, see. Shaking like a belcher's belly. I'd seen tall men before, and dirty men too. But there was none wickeder than the Strander King, and I told him so. He asked by whose permission I was fishing Redgill in his waters, and I told him straight, nobody's. He bent so close to me face that I could see the fleas in his beard. Then I did something so foolish and so desperate that I can't remember deciding to do it. If I had stopped to think, I never would have tried. Now, you Stranders know this. But for the sake of me family here, what don't know your ways at well, I tell you, Stranders are a slimy bunch. Janner expected the clan to be angry at this, but they carried on with their usual backslapping agreement. Slimy as the bottom of the blop, Poto said. Aye, they cried. And if there's anything a Strander respects, 
It's someone as slimy and wretched and thieving as themselves, eh? Oh! They cried again, louder. So you want to know what Podo Helmer did? He cried. Oh! Podo lowered his voice to a near whisper. I picked Graufis pocket. The stranders stared at him open mouth. Even Claxton looked surprised. You picked what? Marley asked. I picked his pocket, placed it right there on the banks of the Black with all his clan watching, and they didn't see a thing. I'm mighty swift when I have a mind to be, and I decided that my only chance was to prove the Graufis the Strander King that I was fit to ride in his company. Poto let the silence reign for a few moments, relishing, as he always did, a tale well told. What did you steal? Someone asked. The only thing I could lay my fingers on. Stole his pwn. Footnote one. In Strander culture, the leader of the clan carries at all times a small item of significance to him or her called a pwn. If another Strander manages to steal the pwn, he or she becomes the new clan leader as long as it remains in his or her possession. Of course, should a Strander fail in an attempt to steal the pwn, the clan leader is free to apply whatever punishment is deemed appropriate or enjoyable. The only thing I could lay me fingers on stole his pwn. At this, the Stranders gasped. Didn't know what I'd done at the time, of course. It was right there in the front pocket of his breeches. A golden bird no bigger than a baby's fist. Growl fist had me by the collar with his dagger at me throat. All his clan laughing and begging him to put an end to me. But before he did, I said, Growl fist, if you kill me and throw me in the river, you'll lose your wee golden bird. The Strander King patted his pockets and narrowed his burning eyes at me as I raised the trinket to his face and winked. You winked, Claxton said, now as lost in the story as the rest of his clan. Aye, old Graufis' eyes opened as wide as his mouth, and he started laughing so hard it scared his clan as bad as it did me. Something unnatural about a man as wicked as Graufis laughing like that. Stopped his clan dead in their tracks, and we all stood there wondering what he would do. Poto paused, his hands out. Palms open to the night sky. Growl fist set me on the ground, hit me so harder than the face that I still have proof. Poto turned his right cheek to the fire glow so that, all, so that all could see the finger length scar along his cheekbone and welcomed me into the clan. Snatched his pawn right back, and since he was the mighty Growl fist, nobody challenged it. it. Wasn't long before I was running with the pounders, and not long after that. Sharn the Tor sent his troops to try and clean up the strand. And you crept the West Redoubt, said Claxton, the suspicion back in his voice. That's right. Well, old man, it's a good story. I'll give you that. Claxton stood and stretched. Janner's blood went cold because it was clear that Claxton's, from Claxton's swagger that Poto's story hadn't satisfied him. Or if it did, he was unwilling to admit it. But not good enough, Poto Helmer, because I don't believe a word of it. No man could have picked the pocket of Graufist the Strander King with his whole clan watching. I'm the finest thief in Scree. Once in Dugtown, I snicked the shoes right off a feller and he didn't even know it till he got home. But not even I could have slipped the pwn from Graufist the Strander King. Claxton drew his dagger. Just as Poto tends to spring at the clan leader, Lily cried out, a strander held a knife to her throat. Poto closed his eyes and trembled with rage. Janner's heart pounded. The fangs were evil to the bone, but these people were worse somehow. Other than their dirty appearance, they didn't look so different from Dugtowners, or from Glip folk for that matter. He was used to the fangs being evil, but not ordinary men and women. Clan! Claxton cried. Poto Helmer, the fat man and the woman, will be sleeping sound at the bottom of the blap tonight. The children will keep, of course. The Stranders surged forward with knives drawn and teeth bared. They tore Naya away from Lily. Oscar breathed a deep sigh and hung his head as they pulled him to his feet. But Tink worried Janner most. 
His brother stared at Claxton with an odd look, not of fear or worry, but was it fascination? Admiration? Even as the stranders jerked Tink to his feet, his eyes stayed on the tall, bearded brigand, and Janner's eyes stayed on Tink. One minute, Poto had held the stranders in thrall with his tail, and a breath later, the Igbys, Poto, and Oscar were surrounded and firmly in the grip of the clan again. Weaponless, with no leverage, no money for a bribe, it felt to Janner that they had finally reached their end. There were far too many of the smelly men, women, and children to fight, and unless Poto had another trick in his brain, the jewels of Anaria would soon be caged, and their guardians would be in the cold black depths of the mighty Blap.